focus on the agenda. We're adding it at the beginning. As part of our chair's coordination with the group. No further questions. Good morning, everyone. Um, would anybody be willing to take notes for this meeting? Is there a hand up there? Oh, thank you. So we have a note taker. I also see that uh, Rodney wants to share a slide deck. Um, that's unexpected. I assume that this was a mistake. I'm just uploading some replacement slides for Greg's talk. So if you've looked at the slides on the meetings tracker, um, have a look again. This is TSVWG. We've helpfully switched over. So I'm Gory on this side, and this is Martin. This is Martin on this side. We're the working group chairs. If you have things that you feel should be brought to the group or comments on the drafts in the group that you are not sure about whether to contribute, the answer is probably send an email to the list. But if you're in any doubt, then please do just contact us. We're very happy to help you to input into this working group. We have an agenda. 
first of all, we have a note well. Please read it. It's important. There's a code of conduct in there and there's rules about intellectual property. And yes, we do have an agenda. And we have one thing on the agenda that's not on the slide, which is a presentation about um, Happy Eyeballs uh, version three. And we'll do that um, right at the beginning. We'll then have some discussion on um, ECN, including a presentation with, um, with a recent experiment on L4S. We then will discuss the, S, um, the SCDP drafts. We'll talk about UDP options. And then we have some time for individual drafts, hopefully. Any agenda bashing? That is not the case. Uh, are any of the authors of the list of slides um, in number 10 not sent us some slides and wish to send us one slide? Then you've probably missed the deadline, but we can still talk about the draft. So no, no agenda bash, so we'll move on. Tommy? So while Tommy's making it to the stage, we should give a little bit of background. This is a draft that was presented in V6Ops. If you were also in V6Ops, then you may have seen this talk. That would be good. I think many of you weren't from looking around the room. So the point is to coordinate this work between V6Ops and the transport area. Happy Eyeballs is all about selecting transports, and therefore it should be interesting. Uh, whether we do this work in this group or not will be decided when an adoption call is made, but it might well land in another group, I think. All right, there we go. Hello everyone, I'm Tommy Pauly um, from Apple and speaking on behalf of my co-authors, David, Nitty, and Kenichi. And this is something that, as was mentioned, we already presented in V6Ops. It is targeted there. However, uh, in that discussion and other discussions, it was brought up uh, that this is something that a broader community should be aware of and have input on, uh, particularly uh, DNS and also transport. So I'm gonna go very quickly through these. I don't wanna take time away from the rest of the agenda, but I wanna highlight specifically the things that may be interesting to transport here. All right, so Happy Eyeballs is a, a, a way to race uh, connections. It was originally done to handle uh, breakages of IPv6 versus IPv4. And uh, generally you have, actually I'll, I'll just jump to the next slide for context for people. Um, you have many different addresses you get back from DNS resolution, and then you try them one at a time. Um, and these, this is a staggered race. Now, the interesting thing for transport is that this has always been written in terms of TCP connections, and it's like, okay, you have your TCP handshake, and that determines when a particular address is connectable, uh, but you also use the TCP retransmit timer values as when you would stagger the next race. But since uh, Happy Eyeballs was originally developed, there have been a lot of changes. Some of those are more in the DNS world. We have some new records that have recently become RFC for SVCB and HTTPS. That gives us other ways of getting addresses and it gets priorities between records. But it also includes ALPN. And so now we have DNS records that are part of this process that are giving us hints about things like HTTP3 and HTTP2 which really translates down to quick versus TCP. And so now we have some extra transport information being thrown in here. And also since Happy Eyeballs uh, was devised, we now have quick as an alternative transport that has become very, very common. And that is something that in general, the draft needs to be updated for. So that's what we'd love to have your eyes on. So jumping forward, um, these are just some of the changes in this recent version, uh, a lot of these bits around SVCB are not necessarily super relevant here, um, other than the fact that 
we do now have information about ALPN and transports from the SVCB records. And uh, one of the key insights uh, that we've had as part of the update is trying to uh, update the notion of what the handshake completion is for a given transport connection. Um, previously, this was just a TCP handshake, but when it's quick, it needs to be the quick handshake. And there's also been uh, uh, developments around having that include the full TLS handshake because we've also seen brokenness where TCP is being terminated by proxies, but doesn't actually have end-to-end -end connectivity with the um, actual server that we're trying to reach. Um, so here's the roughly updated sorting algorithm. There's little bits in the middle about having your preferred ALPNs, which kind of translates into your preferred um, transport protocols that you may have for this particular connection. Um, some of the changes specifically around quick and trying to generalize the notion of transport racing for happy eyeballs uh, is that you know the client now needs to have some preference when it is capable of doing both quick and TCP, which one, if it has to choose between different services that only support one or the other or both, how does it want to sort those? Um, in general, we would recommend saying that a service that can support quick alongside TCP or just quick may be a good first option because it does have uh, improved setup time. It has improved uh, fidelity of signal for congestion control. It has support for connection migration, et cetera. And then we also need to adjust all the language around uh, the connection racing, making sure that it's very clear when the connection completes. So these are all bits that as this develops, we would really appreciate a lot of the people in the transport uh, area working group. I guess it's not gonna be the area anymore, but um, having the experts in this room have an eye on that and making sure that the language is correct. I'll skip over these because these are very much TLS specific. Um, and so these, these are slides that were originally made for V6 ops, so that's why we say, should we adopt in V6 ops here? But I think that is kind of one of the broader questions. This is something that is very, very cross area, cross working group. It has many legs in uh, V6, TLS, transport, DNS. Um, and one of the other things I want to point out for uh, the transport folks in this room is that we also have work that we've done in the TAPS working group, which is specifically around uh, doing racing between different types of transports and trying to have, you know, I can switch between QUIC or SATP and TCP. That has a much broader architecture of trees of racing and Happy Eyeballs has always been a part of that. Um, but that is an area where Happy Eyeballs and some of the broader transport work is in dialogue. All right, um, I see Lars in queue. Uh, that's all I have for this. So let's take questions on whether the IETF should do this kind of thing, opinions on whether this group has inputs or any help on the general topic and move quickly. Lars, yeah. first up. Yeah, Lars, okay. so I think this is uh, a great uh, update <laughs> to Happy Eyeball, so we should definitely do this with the IETF. I really wonder why V6Ops thinks it's the right group for this, or you think V6Ops is the right group for this, rather than like here or somewhere else transport -y. So the, the reason it kind of naturally falls initially into V6Ops is that V1 yes. and V2 were there. Having the presentation of V6Ops, there's also a lot of great input they had of other things that need to be updated there around the uh, changes in development in V6-only networks. So like we, we have expertise from so many different parts of the IETF that all really should be contributing. Um, I don't know so where it goes. The, the argument I would make against V6 of this, this while, I, while it started there, yes. and, and at that time, the big thing was like, how do you do V4, V6? How do you handle that? Um, I don't see any growth there, um, right? I don't see V10 coming at any point. So I think the... Um, Diversity exists now in at other layers mm -hmm. in terms of TLS and other things you mentioned here, mm -hmm. right? And so I think um, going into groups where you, you expect that work to happen that will complicate this further in the future maybe would be what I recommend. But, you know, um, I don't feel very strongly. I just think V6 up is maybe the, the correct venue in the past, but might not be the correct venue in the future. Thank you. This is a discussion we need to have. Brian? 
Uh, hi, uh, Brian Trammell. I put my hand up before Lars spoke. Um, I agree with everything he said. Um, I would note that this looks now very witty, right? Like, yes. so this is this is the this is the canonical first draft for the new area because you're looking at you're looking at sort of like things that have come out of the website of things like LPN, et cetera, et cetera. You're looking at things that have come out of um, uh, of the transport side of things. The V6 thing is now kind of like a historical reason why we did this, but this is, you know, not that. I would, at the risk of angering Lars now, in order to, uh, in order to, you know, not agree with Lars, if TAPS were a group that we were not looking to close as soon as it finished its current work, which I think is an excellent idea, this would fit in TAPS very well. Um, given that we are doing that and having been in that working group for six years and made a Petra Kucha slide about how long that had taken last night, I think it's a good idea to close that. That points as a default to this group as the place to do the work. Uh, Martin Duke, um, am I correct in, in um, understanding that like you guys are already doing this and so you are not like facing incredible urgency to like publish this as soon as possible? Certainly no urgency to publish. Um, as far as like the implementation, the bits around adapting to SVCB and priority and address hints, that is something we've been running actually for years at this point. But I think there's a lot of discussion that still needs to be had about how do we correctly incorporate the preferences around ALP and like some of these other more interesting transport or ECH priority questions. I think there's still a lot of room for discussion and debate about the right way, but like this is all an algorithm and a heuristic. So there is no time urgency around any of it. I think it's more valuable to get the broad input of the community to come up with what is the best thing to do. Okay, lovely. The reason I ask is just to propose a way forward. Um, I think the I think the, the, the normal way we would do this is just the ISG discuss it and see if yep. like we can Please converge do. on something, um, which we can probably do tomorrow, or at least, at least try tomorrow. And if we can, if we fail tomorrow, then uh, that's what dispatch is for. So, uh, which is why I was wondering how urgent you were, because that kind of sets you back another meeting in terms of in terms of um, cycle. Okay. Doesn't matter. Well, I think that's probably the best way for, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of valid opinions here, but yeah, you're right. There's a whole, there's stakes in lots of different areas. And um, I think four different areas at least could, could claim this in theory if they wanted to. Right. Thanks. And I, I do agree with Brian about uh, the witness of this. I think the reorganization of the areas does make it fit more in wit than other areas. Um, but then I think it's a question that I would love both the ISG and the working group chairs of this group to talk about is the evolution of TSVWG within WIT. Is it going to be like the generic WIT place or is it still going to try to be very transporty? So it's, it's an existential question for us. Uh, no, it is, it is not the generic WIT place right. as currently conceived. Right. Okay. Go ahead. I seem to be in the wrong place in the queue. I should have been before all that because it's an individual comment. Um, I think this is, an in, as an individual, I think this is an interesting draft because it requires inputs from some working groups and decisions by a working group. And we've not been doing so many of these at the IETF. We tend to go off into our working groups and do work. So this is an interesting thing for the IETF to do well because getting input from multiple places is something we should be able to do and uh, yeah, um, let, let's do this work somewhere. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Come back and give us an update if you happen to do it somewhere else. Next slide. We have a bunch of slides about L4S and Let's start with the field test update. All right, so you said I have an hour, right? No, just kidding. Um, thanks, um, Jason Livingood, um, and I'm here talking about our L4S trial, um, which is really the first um, public uh, trial, field trial of uh, this technology. Next slide. So just a high level um, graph or chart to show you what this looks like in DOCSIS. 
Um, and SF in this uh, notation means service flow, um, which is sort of a doxis uh, type of concept. So what this basically is representing are a couple of things. First, the low latency um, packet flow and the classic um, sort of default service flow all share this aggregate flow, which means it's all sharing the same amount of bandwidth. One is not allocated more bandwidth than the other, and they're both at the same priority level. So for us, these are two important foundational concepts that we've tried to make sure folks understood that um, you know one of the flows is not a higher bandwidth or higher priority. They're, they're all sharing those sort of things. And the classifier function that really sits in front of it um, basically just looks at the packet header and says, you know, oh, is it an ECN, you know, is it ECT1 or CE or is it uh, DSCP45? And if it is, then it, you know, shunts it to the low latency flow. Um, next slide. Um, in terms of uh, our requirements, first, about half of our network right now is on a virtual CMTS platform. That's our um, aggregation point one hop after the user, essentially. Um, the rest are all sort of older, but you know we're transitioning to the virtual platform, and, and so we've only developed this for the virtual platform. We're using four different modem types. They're all DOCSIS 3.1 modems. Two are our devices that we provide to customers and we manage the software, and then two are retail devices, which we would call uh, customer-owned and managed COAM. Um, so we wanted to have a selection of sort of retail and, and uh, customer, excuse me, Comcast managed. Um, because of the way we've distributed and deployed the VCMTS platform, you can really be anywhere geographically, which is very different. In the past, we would only say, okay, it's in this city or that city because, you know, we're updating a particular CMTS. The virtual platform is, is just sort of rolling out um, now, and we have situations where, like we had a, a, a user in, you know, maybe Cupertino who was like, you know, one side of the street was on a VCMTS, the other wasn't. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's... That's something that we've navigated through. We also saw, interestingly, uh, an amazing level of customer engagement and interest about this. Um, it really shocked us. Usually, if we get like a few dozen people to volunteer for a technical trial, we're like, wow, we've got a few dozen people that know what the hell we're talking about. And in this case, we had thousands of people um, that uh, were interested in, and applied, which you know shocked all of us, but was awesome. We've done this in several ways. First, we always start with employees. Um, they're the best guinea pigs because if they complain, you're like, well, you know, the service is free to you. What do you want to do? Um, <laughs> so, you know, they're the, the first audience. And then uh, we did have done two waves of customers. Um, we just started the, the second wave a few weeks ago. Next slide. Um, and by the way, as of now, we have a, a, a few hundred uh, uh, testers. Um, at the moment, we are primarily testing upstream. This is the prime um, bottleneck in a, a cable network or in the kind of um, asymmetric network that uh, a lot of US networks have. So that meant that we are doing this in the cable modem itself, um, and we're supporting both L4S and not, uh, NQB, um, and you can see some of the details um, at the bottom there. When it's our gateway, it's both sort of the cable modem layer two function as well as layer three IP routing. And it has a Wi-Fi function as well on the LAN side. And what we've done there is when packets, um, say, come up or down into the modem and then into the Wi-Fi network, the low latency mark packets are going into the ACVIQ. Um, and the super fun thing about that is that we found that we were actually, as we were getting ready to this and we did some PCAPs in our first few people, um, we found number one, we thought we were not bleaching ECN. Turned out our test was only testing upstream. And when we looked at downstream, like, oh, we're bleaching it downstream. Um, and so we had to fix that. The second issue that we found is we were leaking an internal DSCP mark into the wireless lands of customers. And that would cause all the packets on the wireless LAN to go into the background class uh, for WMM. And oops, that's been for a while. Um, so we went and fixed that on literally every single um, configuration file for cable modems, um, which you know was easy to do on the CMTS. Um, but secondarily, that what worried us about that is like we had to fix that before we really started doing this because we would then have packets at ACVI and then ACBK, um, which are you know pretty dramatically different instead of sort of BE and uh, and BI. 
Um, we've done manual provisioning, and really that means that like we created a few boot files, which are kind of you know configuration files for modems, and we push those out one by one to the devices that are in trial. Not super scalable, um, but we're doing it for now. Um, and we're getting ready to test automated provisioning. That's next, which is really a key enabler for us to be able to scale up to you know, millions of customers. We're also getting ready for downstream support, and those queues would be in the CMTS uh, pointing down. We've just tested the beta code in the lab, and it works. Um, so we're just waiting for that to go through uh, you know, QA testing so that we can get that into the field. Um, and we've also tested end-to-end -end DSCP 45 marking to a peer network, which I'll show in a second. Um, that also was a big deal since um, all that stuff tends to get bleached at uh, domain boundaries. Um, and the other, you know, fun side uh, comment is for the cable modem config files, you know, we keep finding funny things. Um, because it's all manual and it's just like a small team of, of five of us uh, doing this stuff, one of the upstreams was uh, 120 megs upstream and somebody was complaining like, wow, ever since I got this service, you know, it's really seems stuff's a lot slower. And, you know, we thought about it for a while and then like, oh, we missed a zero um, in the config file. And it was like a 12 and a half megabit per second um, upstream instead of 125 megabits per second upstream. Like, okay, well, you know, we, we fixed that. So next slide. Uh, that's a question. Do you want to take it now take it or at the, the end? end? Yeah. Okay. We're going to take it at the end, Jonathan, okay? Okay. Thanks. Um, so what we've done with users is basically, the, you know, they have structured activities. You know, first week is tell us if anything seems really wacky, then start to do web-based and other performance tests and the network quality test from Apple, um, FaceTime testing, low latency DNS testing, some gaming, and then they submit survey forms at the end of each of these tests basically to give us the results. We also have probes that we've installed from all these different parties. Um, happy to you know distribute more probes if people have them. Next slide. So high level observations so far, we haven't seen any issues of classic queue starvation. Um, we uh, actually saw the opposite, which was um, L4S queue starvation because we had some cable modem config um, issues, limitations that Greg has helped us navigate through. We're gonna push um, some code late next week to the modems to fix that. Um, so that should improve some things and that'll explain some of the charts you see in a minute. Um, mostly things are working um, pretty well. Cloud native real-time apps, you know, seem to see a bigger benefit um, than sort of legacy apps, if you will. But we've got a lot more, you know, trial plans over the next 90 days. So next slide. Um, so, yeah, so at the bottom, you know, just something from our end-to-end uh, -end, uh, DSCP 45 testing, which was with Valve uh, game platform. Um, next slide. Uh, you can skip this one. And that one. <laughs> uh, so this is from our, uh, what we call IMP, the, the cleverly named Internet Measurement Platform. Um, and that's uh, basically a measurement agent that's installed on our cable modem gateways. And um, today, you know, putting aside this trial, we run, you know, I think on any given day, like 800,000 or so tests to modems and uh, at all different hours and just to sort of see what the health of, of the network is and, you know, is service quality good. And um, this is a bit of an eye chart, you know, it's sort of showing number one, you know, the, the bandwidth delivery is still um, good, we're still delivering upstream bandwidth in this um, example at the bottom, 103% of advertised. Um, and we've got it on the right, a couple of different device types that the tests are running on. So, you know, again, for us just showing that it's not just one device, a bunch of different um, modem um, models, if you will. And, you know, in this case, this is uh, uh, at the moment just a, a you know, uh, a quick test, you know, and, and we're seeing like a halving of, of the, uh, of the latency, which is good. Um, we'll really be interested to see what happens once we push out the cable modem changes in the next week. Um, next slide. Um, this is from uh, our NVIDIA partner. So they have a cloud gaming platform, GeForce Now. Um, really happy with the results that we saw here. And what's interesting, if you think about gaming, the the, the usage of upstream is not super bandwidth intensive. You know, you're thinking about like 
um, you know, controller interactions and things like this, right? So pretty low bit rate, but pretty important, you know, from a timeliness standpoint. And, you know, with just classic, you know, AQM that we had in the network before, they were seeing like 225 millisecond lag speed, you know, spikes um, with background traffic. Um, and I'm going to mention the background traffic in a second. Um, and then, uh, you know, much, much lower um, spikes and much better jitter, much more predictable latency afterwards, which was really great. They were super, super stoked about it. Um, and I should mention, by the way, you know, we've tried a variety of background um, sort of traffic generation. We do and, and have tried both, you know, ramp up and just sort of run a continuous test where you're, you're filling um, the classic queue, um, as well as um, running a test that is more representative of very bursty user traffic. And that's the primary one that we use. It's like, okay, use 100% of the capacity for a few seconds and then nothing, and then use 50% and then 20% and then 80% and sort of skip all around. Try to better represent what you might see in a user's home with traffic hitting a web page or doing some video streaming or something like this. Um, so next uh, slide. Um, and this was just a, an example. So, you know, like in their game, and this was one, it's always hard to find things that are like good to demonstrate to like executives and these kind of things, especially if they're not like really active gamers, you know, because sometimes it's very visceral, like, oh, I can really feel the difference as I'm playing the game. And somebody's not like a regular gamer, you know, they might not sort of get that. Um, but, you know, there's one sort of sequence where you have this animation and the car is on this turntable sort of spinning and there's music that, that's coordinated with it. And, you know, in the presence of the, the background traffic that we generate, you know, they were seeing, you know, pretty high um, pings that you can see in the upper right hand corner, which is red, 259 milliseconds, you know, on the right, um, once it's in the, the uh, El Forest um, queue, it's, you know, 28. And just the visual difference of like, on the left, it's like jerky and it stops every few seconds, and, you know, and the, the music stops and then the video starts, you know, definitely a, a big difference, which was kind of cool. Next slide. Um, this was uh, from Valve um, and uh, their Steam uh, platform, Counter-Strike, in this example. There's a couple different games we've been testing. And here, um, you know, the difference is sort of in the bottom two uh, points, which is the, the difference uh, between idle latency with no traffic and um, traffic being generated and looking at the, uh, the, the lag for the game, you know, big difference, uh, small difference there, excuse me, uh, so big benefit. Uh, so we were happy with that. That, that work continues. Next slide. Um, so this comes to one of the areas that we found in terms of bugs. So the Apple responsiveness test, you know, tries to do, um, you know, higher amounts of traffic. And uh, this was one of the things that clued us into, oh, we think we have a limitation in our modem config file for um, sort of the, the amount of bandwidth um, that uh, the low latency queue has access to and where we found a couple of config um, file errors. So we're working to, to fix that and these, you know, should, uh, should look different. Um, you know, this was a bit of a head scratcher when we, we were in the middle of it. Next slide. Um, and this is an example um, of one of a couple of different uh, probes that are out there. This one's from University of Chicago. Um, Nick Feimster and his team uh, run this, it's called Net Microscope. Right now they are only doing classic Q, you know, working latency kind of traffic. Um, and what we're hoping to get from them and from Sam Mose and some others is, you know, they can run that sort of cl classic or normal type of latency under load test, but then they're also running a test um, when they're marking packets for the L4S queue and seeing, you know, what the difference is. So this consider this is sort of like a baseline of data collection. And then once these platforms are able to mark the traffic, um, which depends on sort of the operating system of their particular probe, um, then we can see the difference. So next slide. Uh, same thing for Sam knows. So they implemented the Apple network quality test, which was kind of cool. Um, so again, we're waiting for them to get to a point where they can do marking and then we compare, compare that to a baseline. Next slide. So next steps, um, we expect to continue testing through February or maybe March, um, and then we're probably out of things to test. Um, as I mentioned, downstream, um, you know, queue ha has been tested um, and we're looking to deploy that. Automated provisioning is a super big deal from a scale standpoint. Um, and then, you know, we're continuing to solicit um, suggestions for tests that we would like to have users run. Anything you're curious about, you know, we. 
we send weekly assignments out to users and happy to add anything that you'd like. And really the sort of bottom line is getting ready to scale this to millions of users next year um, from our standpoint, you know, assuming it all works um, in terms of our validation over the next couple months. But that's the, that's the plan at the moment. And um, I think that's it. And we can take questions from folks that might be in the queue in the next four or five minutes. Jonathan. Okay, I've uh, come up with several questions now. Um, let's start with the more general one. Uh, first, a general comment that these results look very typical to um, deploying Cake on the upload, uh, which I've been doing for several years. Um, anyway, the most important question is, how vigorously are you looking for harm to innocent bystanders? Because I don't see any of that anywhere in the slides. Yeah, very vigorously. Um, the users are provided with um, not just the first week to monitor all of their current activities and report any noticeable difference, but every single week when we give test assignments, we reiterate the same thing. We've had customers open tickets where they reported issues. Um, one of the- No, 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 no. Not participants, not no. interested observers, innocent bystanders. Important distinction. Okay, what what uh, other innocent bystanders, like people walking by the houses in the street, or who are we talking I about? I mean, I mean people who are on different networks that don't support L4S, but might right. end up receiving spillover L4S traffic. I mean, you do have interdomain traffic running. Right. Um, no, we haven't seen any uh, any effect on innocent bystanders. Are you look, how vigorously are you looking for it? That was the question. We're we're looking for any any uh, downside effects, and we've got lots of background network statistics and uh, analytics that go on. You know, as you might imagine, um, everything from you know interconnection points to other places in the network, and compare that to the baseline of of existing traffic. Okay. Now I'm, I'd like to go back to what I was going to say on slide four. Yep. Um, don't those DSCP leaks and DCN bleaching that you had to correct uh, invalidate a lot of the arguments that were presented for using ECT1 instead of a DSCP? Right. So you're saying, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, the most networks um, you know, have their own proprietary uses of DSCP and we were missing a uh, you know, bleaching um, you know, policy on the device. And so you know, we made sure to go out and fix that. But uh, you know, I don't know, what, don't know what to tell you. I mean, you're using DSCPs anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I just wanted to put that onto the record. But it sounds as though you could have been running these experiments as a kind of normal QoS configuration years ago. I'll uh, leave it to other people. Okay. Thanks, Chris, next. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing, sharing all these results. It's really good to see. Um, towards the beginning of your presentation, you um, described, you said something along the lines of, you saw most improvement in cloud native apps. Were you referring to cloud gaming there or is that more broader? Um, we were referring to cloud gaming, but we sort of have this, uh, you know, a bit of a theory, you know, internally about um, what the difference will be for a lot of sort of cloud-based, say, document collaboration, um, you know, cloud-based gaming, other kinds of things versus more, um, you know, thick client that happens to have some, uh, you know, internet uh, traffic, you know. So uh, the, the working theory is that the, you know, cloud-based stuff it might see a bigger benefit, but, um, you know, we'll see. Okay, and also on the, um, if, if we go back a couple of slides, the Apple network responsiveness results, um, on the right-hand side, you were yeah, showing yeah. some RPM changes you were expecting. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, what, so. What does that mean? So um, it means, a couple of things, great call out, because I forgot to mention it. So the, the first challenge that we had, was, number one, 
making sure that the customers that we had were on sort of the latest version of Mac OS um, that had the, the updated network quality test. The second was making sure that they actually enabled L4S um, and, and called that out in the, the sort of configuration uh, of, the L, of the network quality test itself. Like there's a bunch of flags that you can run after that. And so, um, you know, some of that were, were confounding issues that we found. And so when we were able to confirm a little bit further with people like, did you definitely enable L4S? Did you definitely turn this flag on? You know, cause we can't sort of be screen sharing with customers. We did see some, some better differences. On the other hand, I would hope to see higher RPM numbers, um, you know, eventually, you know, once we get the configurations fixed. So is, is that examples of three different customers there, the, they were, the changes yeah. they've seen? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Lars Eggert. So um, you had the slides anywhere in the world on your, uh, no, the words uh, anywhere in the world on your slides, and I live anywhere in the world other than the US. And so I was wondering, obviously, you know, you can't, I can't join this from Finland. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you're aware of any other efforts that are going on where operators are testing L4S that those of us not in the US on Comcast could join. Is there any sort of mailing list where, you know, you guys are talking to other operators? Is there any efforts that you're doing? Well, I know... How can I play with this? Yeah, I can do it, yeah. I mean, first I will say, you know, Greg um, White, who's in the audience uh, from Cable Labs, has been running these interops um, for a while. I think probably has had uh, a variety of equipment vendors come. Um, certainly we've seen in interops here, um, you know, uh, PON demonstrations, 5G demonstrations. I don't know where any of those networks are. Um, you know, I don't know, Greg, if you have any uh, great idea. I know certainly talking to other cable companies there, you know, there's a lot of information sharing going on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interest and a lot of network operators who are planning their uh, deployments. Um, but so far, the only uh, trial that's been announced is the Comcast one. But uh, I'd say stay tuned in the future. And part of my 2024 plan is, you know, go out and talk to some of those operators and uh, so on. Start in Finland. Yeah, <laughs> in Finland. So I see the, the work item um, reporting on L4S is November next year. Yeah. So hopefully by that time, we will have other talks from other people as well to go along with this. Yeah. We'd love that. We've got one more question in the queue. Uh, hi, Jason. This is Dan Drutzer with at and um, Sign me up. I, 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 unlike uh, Lars, I'm a Xfinity customer. So. <laughs> nice. Um, well, quick question about so, uh, email me your address and I, I can find out uh, if, if you're on VCMTS. Yeah. Um, on the in network uh, in home topology, yeah. I'm curious if you I understand that the immediate uh, need for tests was to connect directly to the cable modem, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you have any any results on a on connections that are you know, to other from other devices in the net in in the home, particularly Wi-Fi routers, uh, switches, and other things that you know homeowners tend to uh, to install, and they're out of your control. So, um, I, I'm I'm curious if uh, if 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 those can be included in uh, in your future tests um, because I think it will be extremely useful. Let's say a, a, an iPhone connected to right. um, to a um, to a Wi-Fi router and that connected to the modem or even to a switch and then to the modem. Yeah. So curious about that, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good good uh, suggestion. We'll make sure we do that when we release more data. We are collecting it, you know, when the users tell us, you know, we're asking, are you on ethernet or you're on Wi-Fi? And then we know what kind of device they have, you know, so that can help. E even on inter ethernet, if you got yeah, a switch yeah. uh, in you front of your yeah. cable modem, thank you. Um, Thanks, thanks for this presentation. Can you go to slide number four? Yeah, so, so you mentioned that you did the test with FaceTime and also gaming, right? So I'm curious that why you are putting everything on SCVI in Wi-Fi? Um, I think it's in one of the recommendation documents. Uh, I don't know if it's... Uh one of the first three, or it's one of the active ones you have, Greg, got it. Yeah, it was so, recommended to use a different um, Wi-Fi uh, WMM, you know, class than uh, ACBE. Um, 
you know, to get, you know, because each, each of the, those four WMM, you know, sort of queues, if you will, have different um, types of configurations and, and so on. Yeah, correct. So I, I am wondering whether you're following RFC 8325. Um, I have to look at 8325. I'm not. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, because if you follow that, then I think gaming and, uh, you know, uh, interactive videos yep. will be in the different uh, classes. So if you put everything on the SCBI, then I think it's, it's, it's not a fair to invent. Yeah, maybe. I mean, keep in mind, I think the, the primary, uh, you know, place a lot of this stuff happens is in the downstream co packets coming into the Wi-Fi land because on the origination of the packet side and the client side, you know, they can kind of mark however they want, right? And the Wi-Fi sure. network is going to do what it wants to do. So on the upstream side where the bottleneck might tend to be um, typically, um, you know, it, it, it's going to mark it, you know, however the, the client wants to mark. Yeah, that's correct. But I, I'm just more interested on the downlink side, right? Yeah. From AP to the client, right? And if we follow that, then I think there should be a separation between, of course, that RFC didn't have 45, you know, DSP marking right. that time. Yep. Maybe some additional update is required, but I think gaming and uh, conversational video should be in two different classes. Right, okay. Uh, Tom from Huawei, uh, thank you for the great results. And I, actually, I also look forward to other more test results uh, regarding uh, other access types like yep. uh, 5G or something. So my question may be some uh, related to some technical details, like how do you set the CE marking thresholds? Like, or did you tune it or do you use some default value for all the traffic? Just I mean, just to avoid uh, like negatively impacting the user experience. Yeah, I mean, I think most of that is done on the client side. So the application software, you know, can decide to implement in different ways. Like the FaceTime, you know, application could decide to do something different from the gaming client or something like that. Unless you have any other comments about uh, the docs and specifications that Greg wrote. Yeah, on the CE marking threshold specifically, um, that's one of the uh, configuration file changes that Tech is going to be rolling out soon. Uh, currently, as I understand it, it's a, it's a very low threshold. Um, so there might be some excessive uh, CE marking happening uh, with, with the current testing, but um, the intention is that it will be around two milliseconds of uh, buffering delay would be the, the max threshold. Cool, because uh, one thing I'm wondering is that it may not be the best uh, option to just set the C uh, marking threshold to the same value for all uh, scenarios. Like uh, we have conducted some uh, 5G tests with FOS, just using uh, real uh, 5G, 5G RAN devices. And we see that uh, no matter what's the uh, thre uh, marking thresholds, because of the, for example, the uh, versus scheduling or some other uh, non-congestive behaviors within the 5G scenarios, then the tail latency will just w will not be uh, decreased to a super low value. And in that case, if you set the uh, threshold to an uh, extremely low value, like several milliseconds, you actually there there are actually negative effects to the throughput and also the bandwidth utilization efficiency. So I would like to see some discussion on that <laughs> maybe in the future for mainly for other access types, thanks. Yeah, I think particularly for uh, networks where the capacity rapidly varies, mm -hmm. um, like in wireless networks, um, I think having a little bit more of a buffer gives you the advantage of having bytes in queue that you can then flush out of yeah. the queue as soon as there's capacity available. Yeah, you can a fixed network, maybe not uh, as big a deal. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks, great comment. We don't have anybody in yeah. Okay, so we're we're going to close the queue s soon. So this is notice that the oh, yes. the queue is closing. If you really think you have something important, join it, join the closed queue. But otherwise, this, the queue will end um, after these two talks. Cool. Yeah. Hi, uh, Madan from Samsung. Uh, yeah, I mean, really uh, interesting to see the results uh, presented. So I have like uh, two queries that. One is like uh, when we saw the gaming latency, uh, yeah, as, as uh, someone mentioned, like uh, once we put uh, the packets into ACVI, so definitely uh, the Wi-Fi is going to prioritize a few of the packets. 
So I, I'm just, I mean, uh, the RFC 8325 recommends uh, the interactive gaming to be uh, part of the VI. But uh, from the experiments, whatever uh, I've done so far, I feel like uh, the gaming does not actually uh, follows that. So the, my first query is like, did we ensure that what we benchmark with the uh, the default case uh, was it also in the ACVI? Uh, I mean, was it suffering even when it, it was in uh, the VI priority? So that's number one. And uh, number two is like, any plans uh, for uh, testing with the Android or uh, like uh, the other devices. Um, all right, so I'll hit the second question and then the first question. In terms of Android, um, I, we have users, um, you know, running tests with whatever they have, and of course, using their normal applications and devices as they as they have. So, you know, some certainly people are using Android. We haven't done any Android specific tests. Um, if you have any. Um, you know, we'd love to uh, love to talk about any ideas and, and introduce those. So, you know, hit me up uh, offline if you want. Um, in terms of the first one, you know, the testing that we've done so far is only uh, in the upstream direction. And so, um, you know, really once we, once we get the packet off the wireless LAN, we're looking at the, the CE or ECT1 or DSCP45 marks and then putting that in the upstream low latency queue out of the cable modem through the access network. And so that means on the Wi-Fi LAN side of things, you know, if the client has chosen to mark as ACVI or ACBE or ACBK, you know, that's just going to get, um, you know, handled it, you know, however, um, you know, the, the Wi-Fi network wants to handle that. So we, we haven't been able to sort of set that. Once we do downstream testing, then we'll see the difference um, on the downstream side, as the packets come into the wireless LAN from the from the uh, from the, the sort of internet side of the interface, if you will. Thank you. Uh, we'll connect offline as you get the same. Thank you so much. Nice presentation. We have one more. Or more? We have no one in the queue. No. Thank okay, you so much for right. providing that update. That was super good. Thanks come back much. again. Yeah. Other people, if you also have operational experience, please contact the chairs. We would love to present more experience as we go through this period of testing. Thanks. Greg, you're up. All right. Hello, everyone. Greg White, Cable Labs. Um, first set of slides here to talk about the L4S interoperability events, uh, give everyone a brief update on work that's been going on uh, both here at the IETF and, uh, and other places. I guess I'm in the queue now. We can, we'll kick you out of the queue. <laughs> uh, all right, next slide. Um, so um, I think probably a lot of you are aware that we've been running this series of interop events here at the IETF meetings. Uh, there have been four of them. There's, uh, there are links there to the presentations that were developed um, for each of the events. Uh, we've been running these in conjunction with the hackathon. So we start uh, on the weekend before the IETF meeting, kind of get the network set up, uh, bring the participants together, and then we continue through the rest of the week. So the presentation that's linked um, in those links is actually the hackathon uh, conclusion uh, presentation from uh, Sunday of the event. So uh, it's kind of early on actually in our testing process. And, and so it was more um, kind of saying who's participating and what the uh, intent is for, uh, um, for uh, test coverage for, uh, for that event. Um, the current one is uh, still running. Uh, um, I see several of the participants are here in the room. So probably not a lot of testing going on actually right at the moment, but uh, uh, feel free to stop by. We're in the uh, ballroom foyer. Uh, the network will be set up through at least midday tomorrow. Um, so if you want to stop by and see uh, any of that testing, or if you have an implementation of L4S that you're working on, please uh, bring it by and, and connect it into the network and, and, uh, and give it a, a try. Um, in addition to the uh, IETF series of uh, interop events, Cable Labs has been hosting a series of events at our facility, um, and uh, and that's um, been pretty useful for the cable broadband uh, network equipment vendors because 
that equipment is large and uh, sort of complex to set up and uh, it's already in our lab and so um, it, it's uh, been pretty convenient for just application developers to come in and do uh, similar testing but across a, a range of cable network equipment and a range of configuration files, et cetera. Um, and uh, there are upcoming ap opportunities. Um, so if you did not participate um, uh, so far and you're working on an L4S implementation, please uh, uh, consider joining one of the upcoming opportunities. The next one at Cable Labs will be in the beginning of December. Registration is open for that, the link on the bottom there. And then uh, assuming we get critical mass, um, Brisbane in March, uh, we'll plan to do another event. Um, and if you have any questions about uh, participation in interrupts, please drop me a, a mail. Um, so I to yeah, quick question, Greg, yeah. Lars Eggert. Um, I wonder if you had have had meetings at uh, Nanoc or RIPE or were planning to, because it seems like yeah. that would be sort of the next step for socializing this stuff. Have not had. Um, it's an interesting idea. Uh, thank you. Okay, next slide then. Uh, so the next couple of slides just go through the, the participants uh, who have been involved in the interop so far. Um, we have was it, nine different congestion control implementations um, that have been involved. And actually, I see these are not the latest slides, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the, the three on the bottom were new this time, and, we're hi and I highlighted them in the uh, updated slides that are on the uh, data tracker. Uh, so Scream V2 is a, a new version of the real-time congestion controller that uh, Ericsson has been working on um, and uh, was tested the first time in conjunction with some of the other congestion controllers this week. Uh, the Quick Go Prog, um, I think this first time that it has been tested, or the L4S branch of that has been tested uh, in uh, an L4S network and um, hopefully a little bit more testing will be done before the end of the week on that. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> okay. Um, and then Netflix uh, uh, joined this time with their rate controller that uh, they're designing for uh, their cloud gaming uh, application. So uh, in addition, uh, three, uh, three implementations of Accurate ECN in uh, network stacks, and then the, the Wireshark uh, packet dissector, which um, uh, can display the Accurate ECN information in, in packets have been involved as well. All right, next slide. On the network side, um, so uh, DOCSIS equipment, uh, more than 10 different models. It's uh, really two different chipset implementations and then uh, the OEMs that, that build modems um, on top of that. Uh, and then uh, three different CMTS vendors have participated. Um, and uh, Wi-Fi, the Nokia Wi-Fi access point, uh, Google Nest participated in the first interop uh, with their home router. And then the 5G ran, folks who were in the London meeting, um, Ericsson, both Ericsson and Nokia had their 5G ran equipment uh, for testing. And then the last couple of interrupts, the GPON implementation from Nokia. So I think that's it for that piece. So if we move on to the next. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so, right, can you, yeah, can refresh or there is a, you need to read, right, okay, so the slides would, if you're going to send slides, it's really better if you send them a day in advance, so we get them synced through the system, and we updated them, and therefore, uh, we updated them wrongly, and now we probably don't have the right, do you have key pull a new version or not? If we can't, then do NQB and we'll figure it. Sure. Right. Um, we'll figure it. Go and do NQB. All right, um, the NQB draft. Um, so we're up to draft number 21. Um, and uh, the new, uh, or one new thing to point out is there is a third co-author now. So um, uh, I asked, uh, uh, Rudiger has made 
a tremendous number of comments and, uh, and improvements to the document through his suggestions. So we've added him as a co-author of the draft as of 21. So next slide, please. And thank you, Rudiger, for all of your work in, uh, in reviewing the document. Um, status uh, is um, we did a working group last call on draft 14 um, a year ago. Um, and since then, there were a number of working group last call comments, a number of comments after working group last call. Um, cycled through several versions of, uh, of the document. Now at draft 21, milestone is to submit as proposed standard by December. That's coming up fairly soon. Um, I, think we're, I think we're close, but uh, that's uh, maybe a little bit tight. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, this is the list of changes in draft 20. I sent this to the list um, three weeks ago, so I'm not going to go through uh, this in detail, but uh, everyone should have had a chance to take a look at that if they're interested. But uh, next slide. Draft 21, uh, I just posted that earlier this week. Um, only three changes, so adding Rudiger as a co-author, updating uh, Tomas' uh, contact info, and then just a typo, um, adding the hyphen to Wi-Fi. So uh, with that, next line. Um, this draft now, as far as I know, includes all the changes that were requested uh, through working group last call comments, all the changes that were requested after working group last call uh, um, comments, all of the issues in the GitHub issues tracker are now closed. Um, the link is there. Um, and next slide. Can we begin a final working group last call on this document? Well, the charter says we should. Are there any people in the working group who have comments on this? I'm, I'm very pleased with the in-depth discussion that happened on the list and that you managed to reconcile those, apparently, with the people who are talking. The working group as a whole will need to have a look at this. Um, are there people here who would review this if it were put to working group last call? I see one. Are there more? Let's hope we find more. That, that will be the question. So let, let's look for people to volunteer to review this. Presumably lots of people who contributed would like to review the final text. Maybe people would now would like to look at it. Please let Greg or me know if you're willing to review. If we gather a few people, we'll start a working group last call on the next revision. All right. This revision, if it's complete. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, we will attempt. That? No. Okay. Well, we. Yeah, I know which one it is. It's. No, the other one's not here. Well, um, it's in the proceedings. <laughs> Do you, yeah. Would you like to talk to it without without the slides? The slides sure. are in the proceedings, and it's only one slide. Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, L4S Ops, um, for those who may not be familiar, it's uh, a draft that the working group started um, with, and I signed on as editor um, to, to bring together information and, and suggestions and recommendations on how to manage uh, the potential for unfairness in uh, the network when L4S traffic and classic traffic share a single queue um, RFC 3168 classic ECN bottleneck. Um, and so there's a, at least a theoretical um, uh, uh, potential for um, a rate disparity between classic and L4S traffic in that situation. Uh, and so the draft talks about how to identify if that's occurring, how to uh, 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 mitigate the issues. Um, and the working group agreed to uh, keep this draft open to collect um, uh, further guidance as people get into uh, further experiments or maybe have other ideas of ways to uh, analyze if this is a real issue or just a theoretical one. Um, and, uh, and so that's the state. Um, it's it's kind of a, in a holding pattern um, and any input is welcome. Um, please submit your, uh, if you have input via the mailing list or now the draft is on the TSV working group uh, GitHub uh, space. So 
you can uh, uh, lodge an issue there or, or submit a PR if you have content that you'd like to add to the draft. Um, everyone's welcome. So I think that's it. If you have comments, please come to the mic or send them to the list. Since this is now on GitHub and visible more to the working group, we had an issue track a bit forward, but now the draft's there. People can, of course, send PRs and people can send issues. So please do that as people experiment and do their operational experience gathering. Milestone was... Milestone's um, November next year. Yeah. So. So, so we have plenty of time, but we only have time if we do the work now. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks, Greg. Sorry, we didn't get the slides. Uh, we are now um, on schedule, so this is good. Michael, you are next. Um, Michael Tux and I'm presenting on behalf of the co-authors. Uh, document about uh, adding functionality to SCTP to allow zero to be an incorrect checksum. Next slide. So the motivation for this is that SCTP uses a CSC 32C for providing data integrity. And this is an important feature when you run SCTP over IPv4 or IPv6, where it was originally designed for. But if you're in the context of WebRTC, your lower layer is DTLS, and DTLS has a much better integrity protection than provided by the CSC 32C. So basically, computing this on the send and on the receiver side burns CPU cycles, but gives no additional value. So um, the simple extension here is to negotiate at the beginning that you are accepting zero as a valid checksum, even if it's incorrect, and that way you can um, save these CPU cycles in a backwards compatible way. If you're talking to an implementation which doesn't support this, you don't do it. Next slide. So these are the changes due to the um, working group last call comments, which were received. Various editorial changes, so no, not, not from, from a technical point of view. Um, there was a statement in that using this feature must not interfere with middle boxes expecting correct checksums. So in case you run this not over DTLS, but over some other mechanism, you are using some other mechanism which provides the integrity protection and the zero sec checksum is visible on the path, middle boxes might um, drop the packet or do something else. This has been, this was a, a couple of people commented on this, and this is now changed to must not result in path failures for more than a couple of RTTs. Possibly we should change this to RTOs. I don't know. Um, but so for a small amount of time, it's acceptable that you have non-optimal um, connectivity, but then you need to figure out that this happens and you need to fall back to using the correct checksum. So there there is the possibility of using some heuristics. And um, another point of discussion was um, we have the IANA, this document creates an IANA registry for the actual method we are using. One is defined in the document using DTLS as the lower layer. And the question was how to run this. So the current um, way we, the uh, registry is run is um, specification required, which means you need some specification, which doesn't need to be an RFC. It can be from some other standards body or some other uh, persistent document, and there's an expert review. And we define in the IANA section what the experts have to um, check. Next slide. Implementation status. This is implemented in the FreeBSD kernel and therefore also in the user land stack. Um, User SCTP, there is an implementation in DC SCTP, which is Google's implementation of SCTP used in the Chrome browser. Um, there's a patch for the Pi and SCTP stack, support in Packetool and Wireshark. Um, and we have as part of the GitHub repo on the um, TSVWG 
what is it? Organization, GitHub organization. We have some packet with a test, so you can run a test suite against your documentation. Next slide. So the next step is uh, since the working group call, the working blast call is about to be closed. Or, I mean, the, 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 the end date is over, but I think it wasn't formally closed. But um, so I will address any upcoming feedback, but there's nothing on the to-do list left. So questions on the presentation, anybody? Please join the queue. Note to the working group, um, the working group last call period will end today. We, we will submit that today. So um, this is probably your last chance, chance to send in formal working group last call comments. That office, please revise afterwards. Before you can, you can, we complete the working group last call or as we complete it, we have to consider one important procedural thing. This document proposes a new registry. The registry allows non-IETF documents to specify the underlying transport mechanism of which this runs, and that would, in the current proposal, be governed by expert review. The Working group may have an opinion on this, and we will consult the area director on whether that is the appropriate procedure, but that is what's currently specified in this document, so that is what the working group must call is about. Um, Lars. Hi, now I have another question. Um, what's the exact IANA registration policy you're saying? Because not, is, it, is it RFC required, or no, just ex expert review? Specification required, Specific and an expert will review whether the question so okay. there are conditions laid out and an expert will check if they are met. Okay, uh, I actually came up here to sort of ask a uh, question about the uh, check something and um, uh, that I should have maybe asked a long time ago if I had uh, <laughs> seen the presentation. Do you have a rough indication of how much CPU you were saving here? Yeah, so there are users uh, using data channels and uh, what they did is they uh, disabled the checksum on the receiver side and you can gain up to 30% of CPU cycles. So it's a substantial really? amount. Really? Yeah. That seems an insanely high <laughs> fraction for CRC32. I mean, 30%? These were, these, were low, these were low power boxes, which don't have, I mean, ARMv8 has support for, for um, uh, special instructions for doing this, but they were on, on smaller boxes. All the cycles involved in Receive processing. Thirty percent are on the well, CRC. Well, that, well, two statements. One is, I know about someone who has a product who did this to substantially reduce the the CPU amount, so he could do with computing the checksum. He couldn't do what he wanted to do, and that was um, forwarding video frames or something like that. And I, at some point, did some measurements where the where um, this having the checksum gave you about thirty percent. So that's the worst case. So I, I find that extremely hard to believe, but I, okay. I mean, 30% is a lot, right? I, mean, I know. That seems... That's why okay. you do checksum offloading to, I mean, you can... Yeah, yeah but one. still, I mean... I know. Crypto takes way less than that. Crypto has support on the CPU often. Crypto on the CPU takes less than that. Ah, okay. I'm stunned. I can do a CRC32 using lookups in not that many instructions. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> gobsmacked is the response, I think. No, never underestimate the ability for software engineers to uh, introduce bloat. <laughs> Apart from that observation, does anyone, any other comments? <laughs> Let's move to the next slide deck.
Okay. Um, please uh, prepare a new revision when the working group must call closes. I submitted a version addressing all the comments yesterday. So, if so, all the comments are in the current version. Yes, including the last call comments. Yes, excellent. We can um, do a working group chair review and get the AD to look at this. Okay. Um, this is about the document I was talking about earlier. Um, RC forty nine ninety five is the best is uh, regarding SCP authentication something uh, which is pretty old and used for um, protecting dynamic address reconfiguration and is used in relationship when you run DTLS over SCTP. And this is about a BIS document for that RFC. Next slide. So this is the motivation for this. Um, Ericsson has reported um, two security issues. One is that the the keying, which uh, I mean, the the HMAC protection, which is done there, uses uh, symmetric keys in both ways. So what you can basically do is you can reflect messages. That's not what was intended, um, and that's uh, that's clearly an issue. The second one was that um, it's possible that you use two different HMAC algorithms with the same keys. This is. Um, not something you should do, if I understand that correctly. However, there are no known issues in this particular case. So um, the first one is the more critical. The second one needs to be addressed. Um, the next point, which was known for a long time, is that it uses it specifies HMAC based on SHA-1 and HMAC based on SHA-256. And you want some more algorithms, some modern algorithms, and you might want to deprecate HMAC SHA-1. Um, there was some years ago a document um, proposing some clarifications, basically. Um, we should incorporate that. And during some, during the initial work on uh, updating DTLS over SCTP, um, there was the need for some uh, more uh, providing more information using the socket API to figure out what kind of keys being used, what kind of algorithms being used. So that should be included. Next slide. <coughs> That's the status of the document. It was uh, the original one was just uh, uh, the RFC submitted, then doing some changes to XML using XML because initially it wasn't used. And then some changes you can you can go through them via the um, data tracker. So basically, um, the socket API has been updated um, to reflect the requirements of DTLS for SCTP, and um, the author list has been double checked. So I initially started with a list of authors from the original RFC. Um, Ecker don't have cycles to doesn't have cycles to work on this anymore, so he got removed and. Um, Harness was added. Next slide. So um, what's the main issue here? That's a handshake in SCDP where you use, um, uh, where you uh, negotiate SCDP authentication. You have three parameters. One is the random parameter. You exchange a 32-byte random number. You, uh, uh, you say which chunks must be authenticated by the PA, so you only accept them as a in an authenticated way, and you say which HMAC algorithms you support. Next slide. So the main problem here is um, you need to differentiate uh, the roles of both sides. So in DTLS, you use client and server for that. Um, we can't do this on uh, in SCTP because it supports a symmetric way of, of setting up the, the association. So the idea here is um, to use a key vector, which is already used by concatenating the random parameter, the chunks parameter, and the HMAC algorithm parameter, and base the role on which of this key is smaller. So uh, that way you can, can use uh, different keys in direction. The only problem you have is what if both keys are the same? Um, this can be avoided in a client-server situation because the server can always, when it chooses the random number and figures out it's exactly the random number it got, it can uh, choose another random number. But if you have a, 
um, peer to peer setup, you can't do this. So you have to redo the, the handshake and um, you can hide this from the upper layer. But we think doing the, doing the handshake again is acceptable because you have a very small probability of this collision to happen because you're using two 32 byte random numbers. So um, that should be acceptable. If not, it would be good if you can speak up. Next slide. Yeah, that's next step. Uh, I think it's a good point. Uh, it's a good time to ask for working group adoption, since this document needs to be done at some point of time, and it's pretty clear what the what needs to be done. Um, on the to-do list is uh, besides uh, getting the the uh, to to do what's on the motivation. Magnus has done a review of the current draft and has uh, laid out a couple of issues they need to be addressed. Um, anything else which might come up during the work on DTLS over SCTP or any other work in this um, SCTP security um, design team stuff might come up, needs to be addressed and any additional feedback. We'll take questions first on the talk if people have specific questions. And then as people are gathering any questions, we will start that um, adoption question on the list, as in now here. Um, so the first thing I guess, as people are thinking whether they have questions, the chairs will assert that they, we think this falls within our charter. So we would like to proceed with understanding who has read this document. If people have read the document, please indicate. I, um, yeah, well, we'll take uh, one, two, three, four, five, at least four people. Yeah, okay, so we have some, some people who have read it. Okay, um, right, we'll start the formal question. Um, well, please hum or indicate remotely. Um, please don't indicate on in the meeting material if you're humming because we can't count you twice but please hum or indicate in the tool if you think this topic of maintaining this spec is one we should address i hear a small hum please hum if you think this topic is one we should not address in the working group Silence. Does anyone want to speak about why we shouldn't do this? I hear nothing. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we will ask an adoption question here. Please use the tool to record if you are able to. So please use the tool. The question will be, who supports adoption of this draft as a work item in this working group? We will open the session with the question now. Please record yes if you think this draft is a suitable basis. No if you think this draft is not a suitable basis for proceeding or you can record no opinion if you like. So the chairs are recording some um, support for a yes, and we saw 15 votes. We saw two for no, and we're now giving an opportunity for anybody who said no to speak about why they think they may have concerns about this draft or the topic in general. Please volunteer opinions if you can, or talk to the chairs after this. And we saw 61 with no opinion of the total of 78 participants. So 15 say yes, two say no. Do any of the people who said no wish to comment at the mic or off, um, online about why they say no. Oh, 
Okay. We will repeat this um, adoption call on the list and confirm the result here. So far, this looks like a suggestion that we should adopt this as a work item. Thank you for the contribution and work done so far. We will start a adoption call formally on the list to confirm that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops. Uh, Michael, is there anything on the SCTP DTLS group that you wish to report upon? Okay, so repeating that via the mic, there is a design team meeting after this meeting. This will be an informal design team meeting because we want a video call for remote participants, I think. Um, but it will be a point of coordination. We will be having additional design team meetings scheduled um, with uh, remote participation, and from that we hope to see a pathway forward on the SCTP DTLS work. That design team should end at the end of December. I'll report back to the working group. Okay, oh, well, now I see what's happening. Um, we need to summarize what's happening with UDP options, and I shall do that via the mic. <clears throat> So, oh, Gory Fairhurst speaking on behalf of the working group chairs about the TSV WG UDP options draft and the editors of that draft have been talking to me, that's Joe Touch, and so has Mike, who's been on list. Um, right, Th these are my summary slides of what's in the tracker. So this is a summary exactly of what's in the GitHub tracker. Next slide. So we have a bunch of issues. Um, Joe has filed um, Rev 24 during the IETF meeting, which he um, hopes has resolved um, this set of issues. These set of issues are uh, ones that were, are in the tracker, they're visible. I'll go through each in turn. And the intention would be that we close these issues once the people who've raised them or discussed them have confirmed that there are no um, additional work is needed and draft 24 closes them. So um, 18 was um, from the presentation at last ITF meeting about the design goals of UDP options. 15 was about the res option. Um, 12 is about whether OCS is mandatory under certain circumstances. This one has attracted a lot of comments backwards and forwards from a few individuals. If you are one of those people or anyone else interested, please check draft 24 to check that you see this issue closed. Um, number 10 was a pseudocode error, which we expect is resolved. Number nine, a formatting error, which we expect to resolve. Number 22 was to discuss privacy exposure when you use UDP options for which new text has been added to the security considerations. If you think that resolves or does not resolve this, then please comment. Um, I propose that we allow a couple of weeks, and if we don't hear additional feedback, we declare these items as closed. I'll post that to the list. Next slide, please. These are the issues to be resolved. Uh, most of which have discussion points, but require some sort of action. Um, after this bunch, uh, we are hoping that the working group can have a working group last call. So now is the time to check that you have the issues addressed that you feel should be addressed. Next slide is where I think we are at. This is my own personal summary as a chair. Um, issue 21 is discussed, a PR is needed. We don't have a PR mechanism at the moment, so send text to in the issue or send text to the authors. It would be nice to have this in GitHub, I think, so we could actually raise a PR. We'll talk about whether we can get a text there or not. Um, issue 20, we think, is wordsmithing. Somebody has to read through the text and check it's done. Again, the same two-week um, 
cutoff will be done on trying to close that issue. Um, okay, issue 16 is something I'd love feedback from, which maybe people in this room might have a possible input to. So I'd like to explain that and see if anybody does have any input. Um, UDP options provides a fragmentation capability to UDP. That means that a single big UDP datagram can be sent in multiple UDP packets. This raises the issue that what happens when you only get a few of the fragments you need to reassemble a full UDP datagram? What happens when there's a drop fragment? There are two potential things that have been suggested here. One is do nothing and let the application figure out what to do. It's a UDP application. It almost certainly has some idea of what should happen, and it probably has its own application layer way of feeding back what to do when it doesn't get fragments. Maybe the fragment size was wrong, or maybe it's just drop fragments. It can signal that at the application layer using a datagram sent over UDP. The second option is we send an ICMP v4 or ICMP v6 error code in an ICMP message for one of the packets that were dropped, which contains the UDP segment, rather like we send an ICMP port unreachable. That provides you with a feedback mechanism using ICMP that the sender could observe. The UDP sender could configure the ability to receive ICMP messages, could validate that these apply to the UDP flow, could process them, could do something useful. My question to the group is, does anybody here have opinions about whether generating an ICMP message from the UDP stack back to the sender to indicate fragmentation is a good thing, something we should try and write a spec for, or a bad thing? Does anybody have a feeling for this? Come to the mic, please, and help us work this out. Wolfgang? Wolfgang? Um, Wolfgang Beck, Deutsche Telekom. I think it would be a bad idea to have ICMP feedback because if you have things like oversized UDP media packets, you're not interested in the feedback from ICMP. You have other feedback mechanisms like RTCP. If you think at UDP-based protocols like DNS or SIP or something like that, they have their own timeout mechanisms and retransmission mechanism. So I would prefer solutions that simply drop the UDP if you don't have the fragments within a time frame. I understand. Um, so proposal just to let the application layer deal with it. Um, I guess also that means that if the application deals with it, we don't want ICMP messages because we end up with two messages for each packet, which is a bad side effect as in two notifications of fragmentation problems, rather one at ICMP, one in the application. So I hear that. Anything else to add? No, that's good. Who, who's next? Oh, go ahead, Mike. I, I concur with everything that was just said. <laughs> you concur with that. Okay. Um, anybody else want to come in on this? It would be helpful to close this draft and get it published, and this is currently what yeah. we need feedback on. Christian? The, the main uh, way that application deal with fragmentation loss is by setting up the don't fragment bit. So I sure hope that we're not messing with that. Well, okay, the, these are not IP fragments. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay, how do I talk between the bursts of drilling? I'll try to. Um, you told the secretariat, okay. <laughs> and they will hopefully do something. Okay, Christian, hopefully you can hear me. These are individual UDP packets, which can set DF. This is fine, but they are fragmenting a larger UDP datagram uh, at the sender into two individual UDP packets, each with an IP header. So the setting of DF is, is possible. Um, no, I mean, uh, uh, no, I mean it, it, what the application do, what Quick does in particular is set the DF bit systematically. Why we see, 
and does its own packetization on top of that. Yeah, and, and this, I think this is an orthogonal part to this because this yeah. is about um, fragmenting the payload on top of it. But again, um, so, so do you understand what I'm saying, Christian? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, if the application ah. is fragmenting the payload by sending multiple datagrams and the application deals with reassembly and uh, re, uh, repetition of whatever, and so I think uh, I do concur with what was said before. Please don't do anything special. That I hear very clearly. And um, I think that's currently been the consensus. I haven't heard anyone else say that yeah. they want ICMP packets. So thank you, Christian, very clear. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the drilling. Okay, so on number 16, we will provide a feedback to the editor that um, uh, about what was said at this mic here. Right. Oh, do we have a comment? Sorry, I, my, my thing crashed. Um, yeah, Martin Duke and No Hats. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think this is confusing because there's IP layer fragmentation and there, this is like UDP layer fragmentation, if I understand correctly, and then there's application fragmentation, which is quite completely out of scope. Yep. Um, if I think about it that way, then like an ICMP message is a layering violation um, because that's for IP fragmentation. Yeah, port unreachables are at UDP level. So, I mean, it's possible to have a UDP yeah. ICMP message, although whether it's, whether it's the right thing to do is kind of what I'm asking. And yeah. I think we'd have to have a strong reason for doing it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you for that clarification. So we have a number of comments on issue 16, which we will um, edit into the tracker and then hopefully be able to close this. Um, then we have issue six, um, which is the UDP um, encryption. Um, this comes from the last working group, last call, where it was asserted that we don't have a full spec for UDP-based encryption in this document. And we said it would be a down ref to reference the um, individual draft, which is also incomplete on this. And the suggestion was to remove it from the spec, postpone to another spec. Um, at the moment, we still have a assigned UDP option number for this. So we will have to decide as a group or the chairs will have to liaise with their ID about what we do with an unspecified option with an option number. Uh, that seems like a, a thing that we have to talk about. Uh, we will do that if you have feed, feedback or comments on whether we should use an option number to describe something which is currently unspecified, please talk. That is option six. Um, we will clarify this and continue with the working group last call on this item because this I think is just a procedural thing. Number five, um, authentication. Uh, the question was, is this sufficiently mature? It was raised in working group last call, I think, by Magnus. And uh, please look at the spec and comment on issue number five. Finally, issue number four was whether we should include a more complex and probably better RTT estimation algorithm apart from a simple echo. Uh, clearly, we could. So my question really to this working group, which is one I'll paste again into the mailing list is, is the current simple method sufficient? And I haven't heard anyone say that it is not sufficient, apart from people who says we said that they might like it more finessed and more capable. But then, um, as I note in the issue tracker, this is something we can add a new option for in future. So my intention of going through this list is not to bore you, it's to try and close these items out so we can publish a final document and then proceed to working group last call. So it's heads up that this document is actually going to be finished. Can we go to the next slide? Publication milestone was September 2023. Um, yeah, when we talk about RTT, um, accuracy, I mean, it's pretty good. It, we're, I think we're still near September 2023, so I'd like to try and leave the milestone and actually try and get this done before the end of the year. There's been significant progress since the last working group last call. I believe that as a working group chair, the document is now stable, and the issues are very few remaining. 
we will need a final working group last call. So at some point, we would like to make a working group last call for this with the remaining issues to be resolved in that working group last call. Anybody, any questions? Oh, good. I hoped you would come back. Go ahead, Mike. Um, I uh, uh, admittedly at the last minute uh, went through uh, your slides and all the issues. Uh, the current Dash 24 didn't quite get uh, any of the ones that are expected closed fully addressed, in, in my opinion. And I put comments to that effect uh, in the in the tracker. Um, if you could back up one slide, I'd like to make a couple of specific comments there. Please do. Thank you. Uh, number 21 is, is, I think, our biggest bugbear. And it's basically that uh, mo modulo the issue of auth not really being ready, which I happen to agree on uh, after a lot of thought. Uh, those two are specified correctly within the architecture that was set forth and actually published in this in this uh, version, but they defy expectations. And I think the working group really needs to decide, do we want these things there at all in their present form? Uh, the easy thing to do there is drop them all together. If that is not, if they defy expectations and don't do what you want. I am, I just as soon see them gone, but they, uh, APC in particular, the issues were not raised until recently. So I would understand some dismay on the part of our, of our editor for a late surprise. All these things happen. Um, and, uh, I think on, on, uh, um, the uh, the rest we 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 seem to have agreement in principle. Uh, if we can uh, uh, get a get a, a new draft turned around, so that uh, uh, and by the way, it, for editorially speaking, making a decision on whether you keep a placeholder or not for U E and C is it's uh, kind of important to the editor because there are a lot of it, it's used in the, as an example in a lot of places. And if it goes away entirely, there's, there's a, uh, some collateral work there. That isn't a reason for making a, a, a decision, but, uh, just be aware of the, of, of what it, that it, it'll have some impact. Thank you. Okay. I mean, um, just to be clear on the editorial process, Mike, because you might be the man doing it. I, I wonder if we can actually keep the concept of it's, um, you and would have coded this and just, just keep some of that text so that we don't lose the discussion there, but we just don't specify a code point for it because I'm really, I'm hesitant to specify, specify a code point for something that's not specified. Why don't we just write another RFC to do that? Kind of hard to argue with that. Okay, thank you. That's good. Oh, thanks uh, particularly to you for your diligent checking of that. That was so good just to have another person go through. Right. Um, I don't see comments from the working group here, and I suspect we shouldn't take more working group time just to say I think the most likely thing now as a chair that we should do is clear this up as quickly as possible so that we can do a December working group last call and really ask if there are remaining important questions in that working group last call for resolution as a working group rather than just the editorial team. So we will push as far as we can to try and ensure that the working group gets a document they can comment on in entirety. Please uh, then contribute and review. Anything to add, Mike? Martin? Nope, that's what we talked about, so that's what we shall try and do. Oh, okay. Um, I might sit down. <clears throat> yeah, working group chair um, comment. We we have had a full agenda time.
for many IETFs in succession and a set of drafts which have existed for many IETFs in succession. We now appear to be entering the wit area with some new set of work most of which currently uh, has not reached the working group because we have a charter, we have lots of individual drafts, lots of people thinking that, that something should be done here. We have turned away a lot of presentations in the past because we had no time. So we might be entering a new area of looking to see whether there is important work to be done here. I think that's as much as we want to say really. I'm just trying to say that we are now open to listening to people for new items of work, if there is something that's pressing and the community wants to do it. And with that in mind, we will take some individual drafts which are being discussed on the list. Which is John. So this is the media header extensions draft um, and uh, revision three of the draft. The next slide, please. So uh, we've got a lot of feedback on uh, revision two and uh, then following our revision three, we've gotten extra feedback too, for which we've made a lot of changes. Um, I just wanted to run by what exactly we're talking about before we get to what the comments were so that everybody's on the same page. So essentially this is, the problem is that the wireless network capacity changes very quickly. And um, um, on the other hand, media that's sent from a server uh, cannot adapt at that speed. Uh, it, it settles to a longer term average, but it cannot adapt at the very millisecond or sub millisecond rate of change. So what this draft is proposing is to send additional metadata that can help the wireless network make the decisions for those very short time frames. So with, with that overall context in mind, and um, we've, uh, we've proposed a mechanism to send metadata on a packet by packet uh, basis that will help the wireless network make these decisions. Um, that will, uh, the data are essentially about um, relative priority within that flow and um, delay and um, the burst size. So that's, that's, the, that's the aim of it, which I'll get into the next bit. But for this page, I just wanted to go over the main set of comments and where we are. Um, on the metadata, I mean, it's grouped into two sections, basically, uh, the draft. There's one aspect about the metadata itself and the second about how it's transported. On the metadata itself, we've been fairly stable from uh, revision two onwards. Uh, there have been a few changes that were suggested and we've made those changes. Um, in terms of the procedure that's used, um, this, method is, is th there are a number of signaling metadata patterns that have come up in the IETF. This one is talking specifically about sending per packet data that will enhance QoS and it's provided between two domains. So there's a provider B in this figure that writes um, this metadata and it is sent to provider A, which is the wireless provider and it's done on a packet by packet basis. Uh, some other patterns that we've seen include um, an event or a condition in the network that triggers sending of signaling data, but that's not on a per packet basis. And yet other patterns are for services to be initiated in that provider's network and to be granted in that network. So, there are two or three patterns, and this is specifically about the pattern that I just talked about, where the server sends per packet and um, the wireless node reads it and uses that on a packet uh, to group them. So th th this has been, uh, this is pretty stable in the draft. On the transport, there has been, that's the second point I'm going to right now. There's been a lot of discussions we had 
two different options in the draft. One was the what's shown in the figure, read write by the server and read by the wireless node. And another one was, and this is what we call a transport option. The other one was to use a network option where the, the, the option was sent end to end. Um, and based on a whole lot of discussion on, uh, on the list, we have decided to keep it simple and only use this option where there's a producer, a server that writes the information and a consumer, the wireless node that reads that information. And that is sent in an outer packet. Um, in this one, uh, we have a viable solution that can work using UDP options, but uh, we're flexible to have other ways of uh, solving that transport if something comes up, but essentially we wanted to, su to support this use case. So that's where we are on this one. If we go to the next page, I can go, okay. So um, here's the, the set of things that we want to accomplish. I mean, on, on the left side of the page, we have the information elements and the top three, the importance or the relative priority, uh, the burst size that uh, indicates uh, the, 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 a frame in the application and uh, the tolerance to delay that has. Uh, so all of these parameters are the same for a set of packets or a group of packets that uh, come together. For example, an iframe in a video <coughs> or, or a P-frame and so on. Um, they do not change per packet. They change only per application unit or what we call a media data unit here. Uh, the other three parameters, they are at the bottom, the MDU sequence number, the packet counter, and timestamp, they're changing on a packet-by-packet -packet basis. Um, so these together make up the metadata that we are sending between the server and the wireless node. Um, on the right side is the processing. I think I covered a lot of it. This is one way only. Um, the metadata does not uh, change or look at or affect the the payload itself, uh, which may or may not be encrypted. The network entities do not read these data. And um, yeah, the, the model is very simple. The server produces metadata and the wireless node consumes it. Other, there are a few other things that, um, uh, you know, it does, this, this method doesn't affect things like uh, queuing or other aspects in the network, nothing is changed. Only the, this is only for the wireless network, so it's a limited domain and can be incrementally deployed. Um, handling of this in the wireless network and related aspects of fairness and so on are, are handling in the wireless network itself. Um, the signals are advisory. If it's not received, it goes down to basic handling. Um, and um, yeah, there's one aspect about feedback to the server via RTCP and so on. If we need to look at pacing or something that would be another draft. It's not in the scope of this. Did you want to? Oh, and just a clarification question. When you say the values of these fields change per packet, um, are the fields mutable or immutable within the network? Um, they are not changed in the network. They're, they're immutable. So they're immutable. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. So uh, and I think Dan had a question or? I can wait until you finish. Okay. I just put myself in the queue. Thank you. So I just wanted to point out that at this point, we have a very clear separation between the metadata itself and the transport. So we have the ability to, I mean, the metadata has been pretty stable for quite some time now. So, and, and that is the major part of this draft. So as, I mean, the transport, we have a viable transport, but we are flexible to look at other options if there is a need to do that. And uh, I think if we go to the next page, I think, um, yeah. So in terms of how this will get um, changed in, in a revision of the draft, the top part on the metadata, as I just mentioned, is all stable and no changes. Everything is as it should be, maybe a few editorial changes. On the transport, there's like chapter five and six, and now it's simplified to just what's in 6.3, which is, the simple model between the server producing data and the wireless node consuming data using this UDP option. Um, yeah, I think that's it on this page. And I think at the end of it, 
yeah, we we think that the major part of this document, which is a metadata, is stable, and uh, the transport only has to be cut down to the simple operation. So this has been presented um, uh, a few times in this um, working group. There's been a lot of discussions which has which have helped us reduce it. So thanks for all the input and suggestions. That's been very helpful, and we now have a simple transport mechanism as well. I think the feedback we've gotten the last time was in general that people would like to look at this problem. And uh, that's all I have to say about We are not considering an adoption call at this meeting, but um, let, let's take questions first, and, but we will like to ask questions to the group if we can at the end of this session. Thanks, John. Uh, Dan Dotz, at and um, As you would not be surprised, I'm interested in this subject. I just don't know. Uh, so first of all, I have a question about, um, you know, what is the overhead? Have you kind of uh, considered, um, you know, the overhead of adding per packet um, information and specifically information that needs to be updated uh, quite frequently. What's the overhead on the media server? What's the overhead on the wireless node? Um, also, what is realistically, is it feasible? Are the media uh, uh, server providers willing to play along? To me, this is the more fundamental question. Not, not that is it technical or not uh, technically feasible or not. It's just, is it feasible in the wild? Um, and how do you plan to encode those three uh, elements on a per packet. Uh, I'm curious because I've seen patterns in which, you know, the expectation is that there is one piece of information being sent. You're actually expecting to send three. So you got to have some sort of a data structure uh, to come along. So I'm just curious. Thank you. Um, can I respond? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think um, in terms of the size, so if I remember the first question, how big is it? I mean, it's uh, 18 bytes, the data itself. If we add an authentication option, then that would be the additional size to it. So it's not too big. In, I mean, it's, it's pretty compact data, I would argue. Um, in terms of updating things, um, um, I, I, we, we've got it to define it to be flexible. So I think one of the parameters is the importance of the relative priority, which is pretty easy to provide. The other options are um, the, the burst size and the delay, which may not be so easy to provide. So uh, the, the data is flexible in terms of uh, providing just one or two or all three. They're, they're incrementally John, we may, we may need to give short answers. Okay. We're going to get to some questions at the end. But, okay. um, and can I just answer the yeah. last question? You use time as you yeah. like. So very quickly on Dan's last question, I think that was a very important question. I completely agree. The idea of having something in the IETF is to allow many uh, service providers, I mean, the application providers and um, wireless service providers to have a common framework on which, which they can use as a basis to do this. But yes, there are trade-offs in terms of how easily this can be provided or how fast this can be processed. And that's something we need to look at as we go along. Thank you. We only have two minutes left, so please keep your questions yeah. short. Uh, one of my concerns around the metadata here is, is related to how the information the node that actually processes this in the, in the wireless network might actually have to keep state because some of this information and the set of packets is over. It's longer maybe than your buffer depth, which means that you need to keep a certain amount of state tracking things in. I'm, I'm quite worried about this and that the fact that we're doing this and in this case, the our work ongoing in FDP around this subject matter and, and some of these questions seems to have a lot of impact there and it might actually be them that has a very relevant insight into can we do or not do a certain thing or, and, is, and if the metadata is useful. So I'm a bit worried drudging ahead of the PP here. And we're not going ahead if it's an individual draft and we're yeah. discussing whether these are important parameters. We're only going ahead if we actually do a spec. Yeah. Thank you. Martin, uh, Martin Duke, no hats. Uh, 
first of all, to answer the question about media providers, I mean, I, I think I told you this privately already, John, but like the said CDN folks uh, are largely content providers. They're trying to solve very similar problems and I strongly encourage you to align with that effort um, r rather than do like a bespoke thing in TSVWG. Um, I, I do like, I, what, what I really do appreciate how this is sort of migrated in UDP encapsulation, which I think we know how to do. And is like an explicit channel between endpoint and network and also allows us to easily plug in things like DTLS to provide uh, security and, and, and privacy and authentication instead of like having to roll our own mechanism. So uh, like this direction towards UDP encapsulation is much, much better than using UDP options and other things. Thanks. Uh, Hang Shi from Huawei. I think this use case is valid and uh, it can be split into two parts. First is about what kind of metadata is useful for this kind of media where QoS. And the other part is where to put this metadata. It kind of, we should separate these two things. Uh, first agree on the metadata part. For the second part, the encapsulation. I think we may need to uh, to defer it to the implementation or which protocol are you using? You just extend that, that protocol to carry the metadata. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kenji, China Mobile here. Well, I, I know the, the background about the things. Actually, there are a real requirement from uh, 3GPP regarding the work John is doing here. We do support the idea. It's uh, one of the, uh, well, not best, but one of the very uh, plausible options for uh, 3GPP to look at this one. So I, I think this is a, a good one. Just, uh, you know, uh, there are some uh, something else to handle. But thank you. Thank you. Marcus. Right. Um, yeah, I just want to come and say I, I agree with Magnus that we should really um, listen to what 3GPP decides on this because there's a lot of work on the applicability of this. Uh, just one comment. Um, I think you have to think a lot about the trust model and security here because this, these signals can, in principle, uh, configure the behavior in your 3GPP radio and you can allocate resources, you need to maintain state, and there's a lot of uh, work you can make the radio do. So you have to think hard about how you can trust these signals. Thank you. you but we'll be doing that, yes. Uh, Rudy Gagat, Deutsche Telekom. Uh, I'd appreciate uh, if you were discussing BIFSERF a little more intensively in your draft and not just reject all the principles and, and methods which are available there, which you simply do without discussion, which I do not think is appropriate. And um, I also wonder, uh, by BIFSERF, you could signal up to 64 scheduling behaviors. What does this wifey node do? What do you expect this to do? Don't have to answer right now. Please add material to the draft and so that I can have a discussion because for the time being, there's no material and no starting point. Thank you. Um, and Okay, so our queue is drained. Let's try a couple of questions and then the working group will have to close. The first question is, can you please hum if you think the topic of per packet signaling, in other words, um, within the flow, signaling to elements on the path, be they Wi-Fi or 3GPP or something else, is a topic where you would like to see work done. Please hum if you think a per packet option is something where you would like to see work done here. Please hum if you do not think we should do work on per packet floor marking, no. Okay, some hums both ways, probably slightly more for the first one. Um, now a question, who would contribute to this work? Please go, um, enter the um, tool and please answer a question. If you would like to contribute to work on per packet Um, marking for this application. That's it. In ne for network elements on the path to see per packet updates of the flow details. Please say if you are willing to do this or if you are willing to review it. This is not whether you support it, it's whether you're willing to work on it or review it. Yeah. Sorry, we need to bring up a poll. We are doing that and the poll tool is there. Yes. Would you work on or review? Work on this. This is okay. This.
I'm not sure what no means, but um, that's okay. <laughs> <coughs> A valid answer. Okay, well. Okay, so this is really for me to judge whether there is a community here who could comment on this. And I see that 12 people, 12 people? 12 people responded. That's a useful input. We saw 28 people interested at the last ITF in this topic. It's something we will talk to you more about and something which we think the working group should use working group mailing list to develop more thoughts on this subject. So please continue to discuss this on list, John. Thank you. And we will close unless our AD says he wants to say something. And he doesn't. So we close. Thank you ever so much for attending. We will see you at the next ITF. Thank you. Did I just hear somebody uh, uh, sigh in relief? <laughs>